Hi, it's Rob Moore here. It seems to be a regular thing. I think I've done afternoon podcast interviews every day for goodness knows how long. My PA says uh, she's got quite a lot of these backlogged as well. I'm very uh, pleased and privileged to be interviewed on um, the Business Mastermind podcast. So it's with Gavin. I'm going to show you Gavin. Here's Gavin. Hi. And actually, actually, Gavin, the quality of your audio here is really good. So that's great. People will be able to hear the questions nice and clearly. So this is Gavin Preston, the Business Mastermind podcast, if you want to go check that out. Um, we're, we're probably going to talk a bit about the economy, about resilience in business, uh, beyond the lockdown, not just in the lockdown. Um, Gavin thinks there's quite a lot of entrepreneurs who are struggling, and we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to hand over to him. I am yours and yours, Gavin, for as long as you need me. Thanks, Rob. So welcome to the Business Mastermind podcast. Um, I've had a number of interviews with uh, leading business people over recent times. And we've been talking about initially how people adapted their businesses through lockdown. But now the conversation I'm shifting towards, what do you need to do now, given the fact that some economists are looking at the prospects of maybe an L-shaped recession? What are the things that you need to do now in your business in order to you know, not only survive, but thrive over over the coming weeks and over the coming months So, and years. So I think the first thing really is your take on what you think, I know none of us have a crystal ball, but your take on what you think um, will happen in the economy over the next two to three years, um, and then what opportunities you think that presents itself. Okay, so I'm probably not going to answer that question like maybe most economists or business owners might, because I think that there's such an, a level of intricacy and detail that none of us have information on, even some very top economists. Um, I was actually having a conversation with a business associate of mine who said, do you think this whole COVID thing has been created? Because let's be honest, if um, the number of cases don't go up dramatically after all these riots and hundreds of thousands of people this close to each other, surely that must mean this has been a conspiracy. And I said to her, I said, maybe... Maybe not, but we'll never know. And no. you could spend your life trying to find out and you'll never get to the bottom of it. And I believe that's the same with what's going to happen in the economy, what's going to happen in the property market. I don't mind being asked the question, Gavin, at all. It's not about re rebuffing the question. It's just, I guess, being more honest than maybe some people about what I don't know. And I think a lot of people try and answer it because maybe they feel like they should or, um, you know, maybe they think they've got a, a little bit of knowledge on it. I believe a little bit of knowledge can be really dangerous. I think, sure. I think you should probably keep your mouth shut if you have a little bit <laughs> of knowledge. Um, sure. And you see that on social media a lot. So here's what I'm going to tell you that I think I do know. I think you can control what you can control and you should do your best to control that. And then you can't control what you can't. So you should be ready for what you can't control. So the virus blindsided us all, let's be honest. And a lot yes. of people, you know, people saying, oh, well, Bill Gates predicted it in 2016 or whatever. But let's be honest, no one predicted it. Uh, now, I've gone through the emotion. I've kept these mostly to myself, Gavin. But I've, in, it, when it initially happened, I thought, blimey, the property market's going to go down 20 or 30% at least. Unemployment's going to be huge. I mean, all these retail, I, I think um, Zara just um, let a load of people go, 120 stores, I think. Um, Primark's revenue went down to zero. Gap, Ted Baker, I mean, the high street. You'd think logically everything's ruined. Yes. Now, I think people were scared and they thought about that in business, didn't they? But then the government brought in furloughing, which none of us expected, I don't think. Sure. And actually, that really saved a lot of businesses. And that was a great gift. But then when, you know, the loans have to be paid back. I know that, the, you know, they're interest-free for a year and whatever else. And I know we've got some grants, but when the loans have to be paid back or all the staff come off on furlough and then it's like, okay, do you keep them or do you have to let them go? And a lot of staff, sure. a lot of companies are going to have to let them go. So I think we're probably going to see some unexpected ebbs and flows. You know, people talk about dead cat bounce, L-shape, U-shape, all, all these W-shape. They talk about all these things. If I were to predict one thing, and I don't want anyone to base any strategy, if I were to predict one thing, it's going to be the unpredictable. Yeah. And, and I think we could see quite a lot of little highs and lows and ebbs and flows. I mean, if we go into another lockdown, that's obviously going to have a big impact than if we don't. If, there, if, sure. go, if government step in to help some of these you know, big companies that may go under. Um, so all I can say is this. If you're in property, you've got to get ready that there could be a 20 or a 30% drop, which means if you're developing... 
you've got to make sure you're not left having to sell when they've dropped 20 or 30%. If you're investing and you think the market's going to go down, you've probably got to drag out the viewings and the offers, and you've probably got to forward price your offers. So you've probably got to offer even lower than you normally would. Um, mm -hmm. it, at the moment, I'm buying some hi-fi equipment. I um, don't know if I could just show you here, but um, th th you see at the back there, there's, there's a record player. Um, and, and I managed to get a, 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 I managed to get a decent price for that. Because at the moment, I'm going to put in an offer, get a decent price for a watch because I put an offer in. So I think for businesses, people are going to put offers in and they're going to buy businesses cheap. I think for properties, they're going to put offers in and buy properties cheap. And yes. the thing with the property market is to know what's going on in it, you have to have some price, house price data. To have some house price data, you have to have some, price, some property sold. To have some property sold, you can't have estate agents closed for 12 weeks. <laughs> no. So there's going to be a real lag in terms of what happens to the economy, what happens to unemployment, what happens to property prices. So what you can do is be ready. Be ready if they drop sharp. Be ready to, you know, pivot or evolve. Um, be ready for all scenarios. That's all you can do. And that's as far as I'm going to say. And I know that from posts that you made that um, you undertook some financing for a big development before lockdown. So there must have been a bit of a, a clenching moment for you and, and and Mark around, oh my God, what does that mean to us? And I'm interested in the the emotional and the mental journey that you went through to keep it into perspective, to keep calm and you know, carry on, so to speak. Yeah, so Mark and I are very different about this. And I say this with the utmost humility and respect to my business partner. Um, and he won't mind this. And I, and I hope he um, I hope he hears this through someone else, because sometimes the people who are closest to you, you find it hard to listen to them. Um, but I said to Mark, when this all kicked off, we'll be all right. We'll figure it out when it came to the virus. I said to Mark, when um, our board builder went bust, we'll be all right. We'll figure it out. And Mark will be honest. And he said to me, Rob, I just thought it was all over. And I thought business was over. And I thought development was all over. Because it's a 20 million pound plus project, which in that's in Peterborough. If that was in central London, that'd be 200 million. So it's a big sure. deal. It's a 100 unit conversion. Uh, and in reality, it's been all right. So we basically, we had to get a new builder because we, we realized the builder we were working with, we'd done some good projects with them and they were good. Um, but this project was probably just a bit too big for them. So we had to find a new builder and we found a new builder and it was a long convoluted process. And Mark went through endless diligence and research. My business partner is the most diligent and um, well-researched person I know. Uh, and we found what we what believed to be a good builder and within weeks they went bust on us. Um, right. Thankfully in developments, you don't give them the 9 million to, to refurb the project or develop the project in one go. So sure. we, were, we were giving them the money in about 300 odd grand tranches. They got the first 300 grand, I think 70 of it got used and then they went bust and we lost, you know, the rest. So you know, lost a quarter of a million quid, um, which is enough. You know, it didn't kill us, but it's enough. It's enough to hurt. Um, and that's the most I've lost, by the way, on a property project. So we've still got the project. Then, um, obviously, we then go to get another builder and then the administrator of the company that went bust on us and, and wound out a quarter of a million quid of our money um, tried to sue us um, basically for not exiting the contract properly. And, okay. and we're like, wait a minute, you went bust with a quarter of a million pound of our money. That's surely, that's exiting the contract. Anyway, there's this ambulance chasing lawyer that's involved in it who's very good. Um, and it looks like our PM maybe made a couple of very technical, could you call them errors? Maybe, maybe not, that's arguable. Anyway, as it turns out, probably only had a 50-50% chance of winning, even though the company went bust on us and lost us a load of money. So we, had, we settled out of court, which felt really unfair, but we okay. settled out of court. Um, now... So you're now even further in the hole. Yes. Um, so there, there are a couple of bad things that happened one after another. But we always, we always had an exit that we could keep. Um, I think with developments, you mostly lose if you, you build, you develop, you've got an exit price, and then halfway through your development, the, the market turns, it goes down... You have to sell because you can't afford to keep because you need to get all the finance back out, pay the bank off. And yet the properties have gone down 20 or 30 percent. That's what usually kills people with developments. And if you can hold them, you're usually OK. And we had an exit to hold. In fact, about nine months ago, we pivoted our strategy and we decided to hold and take the income. Okay. Um, now, um, when the furloughing happened, if we have to furlough all of our um, workers on our development, then that's just a big time problem for us. That's hundreds of thousands of pounds a month getting burned. But they, they allowed development of building projects to carry on. 
did, yeah. Which was the right decision. Otherwise, we weren't, we're not the only developer. So again, there's, there's some bad things that happen and there's some good things that happen. Now, all, th- it, all through this, I always think we'll be all right. And I always have confidence in myself to figure it out. And I don't worry about what I don't know yet because I have faith that I'll figure it out. And every day is a new day and, you know, I could find a new strategy or tactic or partner or bank or something. Whereas Mark will go absolutely worst case scenario, thinks that everything is doomed. And, t- and until he knows absolutely how he can get out of it, he won't sleep and, you know, he can get quite anxious. In reality, having both of those mindsets in some ways is probably quite good. Because yeah. Mark is actually brilliant. Balance each other out. Exactly. And Mark is actually brilliant when there's a problem. The problem is, the bigger the problem, the more he feels it emotionally. Yeah, yeah. So really, my job in this was just to support him and make him feel that, you know, we're going to be all right with this and give him some ideas and, you know, chuck him some bones. Because he has to know. I don't have to know. I need to find out. Mark has to know. Um, so how do you keep calm in order to be able to come up with those creative ideas, solutions, potential strategies? You, you've, you've got to have that inner knowing that you'll be all right and that yeah. you'll find a way. Well, um, I think they say, don't they, 99% of the things we worry about never actually happen. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. I think I've seen enough of that to know that um, you know, every 5, 10 or 15 years, you're probably going to get one major disaster like a virus. All those things you worry about in your head, they rarely, if ever, happen. All those arguments you have with people in your head, rarely, if ever, happen. So I guess I've learned, A, to let it be and not try and go into doomsday mode of imagining what it would be. Two, I suppose, have faith in myself. Do I have the skills and abilities and relationships and network to be able to dig myself out of just about any hole? I believe I have. I've proven it before. Um, our overhead in our tra- two training companies was about 800 grand a month before the, lo- the lockdown. Uh, and we had to cancel about four months of events, which to us could, could be up to £7 million. Um, and so there's the real prospect of taking zero money. And I'm not talking 100 grand or 200 grand, zero. So there's the real prospect of losing 800 grand, 700 grand, 600 grand a month. Now, even though Mark and I had money to burn for a few months and we had savings, etc., I don't want to burn five, six, seven, eight hundred grand a month. And I've never been faced with that prospect before. Fast forward eight weeks, we've created eight online courses and we've done two point five million pounds in revenue. uh, And we've made probably in those eight weeks, four hundred and fifty thousand pound net profit. Now, by the way, that net that net profit isn't getting spent on Lamborghinis and Ferraris. It's being held. You know, obviously, we've delayed paying VAT and tax because the government have allowed us. We've got, um, you know, creditors that are built up. So we're going to stash that money. But we we, we flipped that in eight weeks. Um, And in the last eight years, I haven't created eight online courses, even though I've wanted to. And the upside of this lockdown is it's just pushed us to go global much quicker and to have products and services and courses for the masses much quicker. Um, so, so it's, 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 sometimes those circumstances are presenting to you where you're forced to disrupt, you're forced to evolve. And this has done that just for your business and taking you online that could give you a, a greater footprint and a greater reach globally now. Forced accountability. It's forced for accountability. Sure. Like yeah, be, yeah. being beasted by a personal trainer every day feels a bit shit in the moment, but feels great afterwards. And without the personal yeah. trainer, you probably won't do any exercise. So yeah. I think you've got to be able to see the upside. And so therefore, you've got to get yourself out of doomsday thinking. I think you've got to be productive and proactive instead of being freezed and, um, you know, procrastinating and scared. And you've got to have faith that what you don't know today, you can figure out tomorrow. Um, And I, I think I have those faiths and beliefs in myself, even if I don't know the answers. I like the analogy that when you're, you're driving your car at night, your headlights only light up the next sort of 200 yards in front of you, but you have faith that you're going to be able to drive safely to your destination, only seeing 200 yards at a time. Mm. But you'll work out what to do with yeah. them, when the, the rest of the way becomes clear to you. Mm. 100%. Right. So um, I'm finding through conversations with business owners that some of them, um, actually, uh, some of them actually in the construction st- uh, uh, industry found sites shut, lockdown, yes, they furloughed. They're getting back into their workload now. But the prospects are looking a little less rosy than they were doing, to say the least, before lockdown. And it's affecting their outlook. It's affecting their self-belief. And to look at them, it looks like they are 
a punch drunk and beaten up. And I, you know, I'm coaching them and helping them, but I'd be to, to, to see for the positive, to get some energy and some passion back into the doing, to redefine their vision. But it'd be interesting what your advice would be to people that are feeling um, pretty beaten up at the moment from a business point of view yeah. and really do need to change my metaphors here, but get back on the horse in terms of their business. Yeah, okay. So we've actually found with our development that we've gone ahead of schedule, which is quite rare. Uh, in, in any development, and um, especially you wouldn't expect that right now. But we found because, you know, business has struggled, our guys haven't got as many jobs and they're ahead on our job. So I think there's always an upside to be had. OK, so I'm going to go a bit ethereal on this answer, Gavin, because what I want to try and do is give you maybe some different answers that you might have had. I don't know if you experience this, but I want to ask everyone watching and listening. Do you ever wake up and for a split second, your mind is completely empty you don't know what day it is, you don't know what happened yesterday, and then in a state of this overwhelming awareness, you remember wh where you are, who you are, and what your life is. Absolutely, yes. And I found the older I get, the longer that time <laughs> yeah, is. Absolutely. So if I'd have had a problem the day before, and it's, it's in my head, sometimes I wake up and I'll forget for a half a second I've got that problem. And in that moment, I am free. And I'm empty yeah. and I'm clear. And then, oh, bang, oh, shit, I've got this problem. Or I check WhatsApp, yeah. oh, fuck, I've got a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Now, I believe that's to do with awareness. So okay. I, I believe all problems and all solutions and all happiness and fulfilment comes from what you put your awareness on. So I don't believe anything is real until you give it awareness. So... People worried about the future of business and the future of the economy. They're putting into their awareness an imagined problem in the future that hasn't happened yet based on an imagined awareness of what they perceived happened in the past. A past is a, a false memory. Yes. Uh, and, you know, worrying about the future is a false imagination. So nothing is real until you become aware of it. So you can choose to become aware of infinite abundance and opportunity uh, and manifesting something new into your life that you don't yet understand or a new solution or a new business model or a new way of doing things. You can choose to put your awareness on that. And if you put your awareness on that, you'll get yourself in a better physiology, for your physiology, a better energy, and you'll more likely manifest that. Whereas if you put your awareness on what you're worrying about happening in the future, you're more likely to manifest that. So I'm really exploring this concept of awareness because, I mean, people who are very metaphysical will say nothing exists. It isn't real until it's in your awareness. And then maybe other practical people will say, well, it is real. It's just not real to you until it becomes in your awareness. But not real to you and not real to you are the same thing. Yes. So I think there's a lot of people scaring themselves into manifesting the very thing they're scared of. You know, like yeah. people in relationships who are so paranoid, they push people away. People who are yes. so scared of their life going a certain way that it goes that way. Because I think there's something very metaphysical, me metaphysical in that energy that they attract. So um, I'm trying to focus my awareness on opportunity. I'm trying to focus my awareness on upside. I'm trying to focus my awareness on, hey, look, I wanted to do this. I wanted to create global online training um, products. And I have now created in 12 weeks what I wouldn't have created in the last 12 years. I'm trying to see the, the, the awareness that now I could become a much bigger global powerhouse. For years, I've been saying, oh, well, you know, property training can't really take that global. And now we've got nine of those 12 courses which are, uh, you know, globally scalable. So, you know, like sometimes you'll have a phone call or a discussion with someone or you've got... A, a phone call that you've got to make with someone where there's a lot of conflict that's going to be involved. And you go over and over in your head. You imagine speaking to them, having this conflict, how they'll react. And you imagine all these scenarios. And that can yes. change your body physiologically. Like Absolutely. I can sometimes feel stress in my arms. Yeah. You know, you can actually physically feel a burning sensation. Yeah, yeah. But that's not real. But you're manifesting that anxiety. So in every recession, in every correction... There's equal downside to upside. Money just moves from one place to another. So Jeff Bezos has been something like $35 trillion, a billion dollars, sorry, more wealthy in this yes. lockdown. More delivery companies, um, you know, lots more e-commerce. Bike shops have really boomed. 
Um, So many companies have thrived. And of course, so many companies uh, have struggled. But you, you can't get ready. You must be ready. And here's the thing. We can all plan for what we know. But you can't plan for what you don't know other than to be ready for what you can't plan for. Profound words. So what can you do to be ready? I think you can have multiple plans. So, okay. look, but by the way, I know I'm talking a relatively good game here, but I'm not, I'm not disclaiming myself from the fact that I didn't have fears and concerns and my brain didn't go AWOL. I can doomsday think just as much as anyone else. In fact, I can beat myself up a lot and I can, if I get in that wrong mindset and I spiral and it gets triggered, I can really play things over in my mind. And so I, 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 there's, there's these different stages of change. And definitely for me, delusion was one of them. And there was a stage before this lockdown where I was just like, ah, this won't happen. Ah, that won't happen. And statistically, I was correct. 99.9% of the time, something like this, when people say it's going to happen, never happens. But then there was a day when it, we knew it was going to happen. And I was like, shit. So <laughs> I think... You were many other business owners. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I would say... About 10 days before I knew it was going to happen, maybe two weeks, I thought, I've got a plan for this. Because even though it's really unlikely, one, if I don't plan for it and it happens, I'm an idiot. And two, what planning does is it calms my mind down. Because really, a lot of this is in our mind, isn't it? Because yeah. like, how many, how many of you watching and listening have heard the quote, observe the masses, do the opposite? That would be for most sure. of you. How many have heard the quote, be greedy when others are fearful? Be fearful when others are greedy. How many have heard the quote, more millionaires are made in a recession than at any other time? (laughs) We've all heard those. So logically, we get that. So surely logically, we should go, oh, well, this is really good because now it's happening. This is my big opportunity. This is my time. This is what I've been waiting for for 15 years, except we get scared. And of course, then we get emotionally hijacked. So there's a couple of things here. When you make a plan, one is you have an option if things change. But two, making a plan quietens your doomsday thinking. It's and you're doing it before it happens. Exactly. So frame my mind anyway. Exactly. So for me, it's almost like therapy. Like I, mm-hmm. when I was in the midst of probably my biggest fears, um, and there was about a week period where I was like, shit. And my business partner's not very good at holding his fears. So he was scaring the shit out of me. My MD was scaring the shit out of me. You know, everyone around me was scaring the shit out of me. I was like, oh, I'm scared. Stop scaring me. I was getting up at two in the morning and three in the morning and sitting in this living room on my own till seven in the morning. And I, was made, I made a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, a plan E, a plan F and a plan G. And what that did was it gave me plans to present to myself, plans to present to my key team, calmed us all down a bit and calmed my mind down when it was racing. So I think, you know, by the way, Brian Tracy always told me often plans don't actually work exactly as you plan them. The the benefit of a plan is not the plan. It's in your ability to plan. It's in the planning, not the plan itself. So the fact that I did a plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F, plan G meant that one of them might work. But the fact that I made the plan showed myself and my team that we could have a plan moving forward. Then it calms your brain down. Then you stop going into doomsday. Therefore, you don't manifest doomsday. And then you think, okay, well, we've got a few scenarios here. And then you've got some strategies to implement. So planning is great because A, you've got a strategy and B, you calm your mind. You you, you know, you're... That doomsday thinking, when we get into doomsday thinking mode, it's all over, we're all fucked, we're all doomed, the world's going to end, I can't do this, it won't work, this is going to be the biggest disaster ever, employment's going to be the biggest ever, it's going to be the biggest recession, Uh, we need to quieten that down. And it's self-reinforcing that you do have the ability to come up with creative solutions to complex problems. Do you know what? Um, There's a lot of things I'm not very good at, Gavin. And um, most people who know me know I'm a relatively humble guy and know that I'm pretty honest about my failings. And this is hard for me to say, but I'm going to say it. One thing I'm fucking good at is creating ideas and solutions to business problems. I know I'm good at that. I've done it for the last 15 years. Um, I have reinvented our companies many times. I've taken two young 25-year-olds who couldn't even grow a beard um, to having the biggest property training company within seven years. Um, we're probably going to be the world's biggest training company at some stage. I've got one of the UK's biggest podcasts. I'm one of the biggest um, UK non-fiction authors. These are facts, by the way. These are facts. Um, and these all came from nothing. 
I've got one of the biggest supporter programs in the world. I'm one of only 20 people to be able to do the, the stars function on Facebook. I'm going to be one of the world's first people to do a paid for live stream on Facebook. Um, Fantastic. And so I know I'm not perfect. I know I've made plenty of mistakes. I know I've let people down. I know I've cocked things up. I know I've rushed things. I know I've been impatient, blah, blah, blah. But one thing I know I can do is I can create a solution to a problem. And by the way, what is an entrepreneur? Someone who creates a solution to a problem, a meaningful sure. solution. Meaningful. The world's biggest problems are the entrepreneur's biggest opportunities. They are indeed. So given the biggest problems and the biggest entrepreneurs, I know you spend time interviewing with, um, in conversation with very, very successful business owners, billionaires. You know, if you would think about this, sort of key lessons you've got from them that would be appropriate right now, you know, what would two or three of those lessons be that would be really pertinent right now? OK, so one of them is that. Um, so two billionaires in the last 10 weeks have said to me, the world's biggest problems are the entrepreneur's greatest opportunities. Um, so I'm paraphrasing them. So that, that's one thing they've always said. Um, being able to look at things on a global level. You know, when you're a billionaire, usually what's happened is you've created a product that impacts the globe or most of the globe. You have to have vast reach and scale to be a billionaire. Um, yes. You know, so whether it's, you know, laying um, Internet cable across the world or whether it's having packaging that gets sent across the world or, or, or whatever. So, you know, being able to transcend your own size and scale and go from um, personal to familial to local to um, national, to intercontinental, to global, and to get this, the biggest entrepreneurs on the planet, intergalactic. You think about Elon oh, Musk, yeah. Elon Richard Musk, Branson. Yeah. Um, Bezos, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Jeff Bezos. Um, who's the Indian chap I interviewed, the billionaire? He's really good. He's the only person um, that has a license to mine on the moon. Um, he's trying to get us off this planet, as a lot of, a lot of the billionaires are. You can find him on my podcast. Um, so I think the scale at which you um, think about problems and the next thing I think billionaires know is um, that the bigger the size of the problem, the bigger the upside opportunity. I think they also know that once you transcend a problem, your reward is a bigger one. Uh, and sure. Most of us, what do we want when we transcend a problem? No more problems. That's it, Naveen Jain. Thank you, Matthew, Naveen Jain. When we've transcended a problem... We want no more problems. That is delusion. That is naivety. Your reward for transcending a small problem is a bigger one and a bigger yeah. one and a bigger one. You think Donald Trump had problems in the 80s when he was just becoming a billionaire? Everyone loved him in the 80s. You know, the art of the deal. They, you know, they loved his double-breasted suit. They loved, his, you know, they loved him on The Apprentice. And look at him now. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're a president, you have to make decisions every day that kill people. Every day. This decision will kill 1,000 people. This decision will kill 5,000 people. Every day. Um, so uh, am I ready to step up and take bigger problems? Yes. Does my chimp brain, you know, my hijacked brain like that? No. Is it scary? Yes. Do I sometimes wish these problems would go away? Yes. Do they go away? No. Will they always manifest themselves unless I transcend them? Yes. And then when I transcend them, ego, Rob, is a bigger fucking problem. That is yes, your reward. Your opportunity to learn, yeah. That's, yes. yeah. that's your reward, your opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, just, I think, finally, what should business owners not be doing right now? Um, business owners should not be... Hmm. They definitely shouldn't be scared. I think, I think there's going to be enough fear. Fear creates accountability. So I, I wouldn't want all your fears to go away. But there's going to be enough of that. Media's going to give that to you. You're going to read stuff all the time about unemployment and, you know, the economy and the property market. So there's going to be enough latent fear out there. So you don't want to add that yourself. So you definitely don't want to be compounding your own fear. Um, I don't think you want to be worrying too much about how other businesses may be struggling. Um, I, you definitely don't want to be comparing yourselves to other people or other businesses. Um, I don't think you want to be... Um, you know, waiting to ride this out. I've spoken to a lot of entrepreneurs, even today, who are like, oh, well, should I just wait six months, a year, you know, wait and see what happens with the market? No, I don't think you should. I think you should be trying to figure out what works right now. Um, and the last thing is, entrepreneurs should definitely not miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I love that. 
What a great note to finish on. Rob, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. So um, can we do a shout out for your podcast on my live? Just let everyone yep. know. Hi, it's uh, Gavin Preston and it's the Business Mastermind podcast uh, produced actually by Rob's uh, podcasting agency of Progressive and I'm very delighted for their, for their service. Uh, so it's the Business Mastermind podcast and uh, yeah, go and check it out. Thank you. And then my podcast is The Disruptive Entrepreneur. If anyone wants to follow me there, I guess many of you already do, but um, we've got to be disruptive in this time. You know, we've got to um, we've got to change the way things are done. And what this virus really has probably done on a global level is shown us what needs to change, what doesn't work anymore. There are massive opportunities right now, like sure. um, online training, uh, Zoom and, you know, online communication e-commerce, delivery, um, blockchain. If you think about how slow the housing purchasing process is, 8, 10, 12, 24 weeks, well, you can go on Barclays app and you can pay a million pounds and it can be paid just like that. So why can't you exchange on a 100 grand property just like that? Why does it take eight weeks? And in August, you don't hear from a solicitor in August. There's so many things right now that aren't working that need disruption. And that is the great opportunity for the entrepreneur. You've just got to figure it out. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Cheers. Appreciate that, Rob. Cheers now. Thank you so much.